What's up, ladies and gents? Welcome back to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I'm here with my great friend, the wonderful, the amazing Ashley Van Houten, and we're going to talk about stuff today. We, <laughs> we've both been traveling the world doing some really cool stuff. Ash, what's going on? So much is going on, and I'm right. really, well, really see. excited that we get to connect again because I feel like when we're both kind of going around the world and doing exciting things, I'm like following everything, obviously, on social media, and I'm like, oh my God, he is hanging out with Thor. Like, I can't wait to talk to him. There's so many things that I want to talk to you about. But I mean, I guess first, let's just talk about our travels because we've both been to some pretty awesome places over the last couple of weeks. You were in the UK and then you went straight to Iceland. I was hanging out in mountains in Montana. So much going on. So, I mean, you're finally back in the States now after all this travel, right? I'm actually back in Canada, yeah. Oh, right. You're in Canada. Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, so spending some time here in Canada doing some business stuff with the cannabis company, and we're getting some things prepared. We had some really cool stuff going on that I'll you know eventually share, but for now, I'll kind of keep that in my back pocket. But I want to ask you about Montana because you kind of alluded to some cool things there, and I've got some obviously great stuff to update about my trip to London and Manchester and Iceland. But I want to hear about Montana because you did some stuff there that's worth sharing. Yeah. Okay. So Montana is awesome, and I went there actually on retreat. And it was a very different kind of experience than I'd ever been on before. And so because it was something I'd never done before, I figured it was about time to try it. So it's essentially this company that's run by a couple friends of mine who are trainers and life coaches. And they were super smart about basically figuring out how to put the stuff that they like to do and their work into one sort of package. And they're getting paid to basically do things that they like to do, which is go on adventures, connect with people, help people grow, help people be happier and healthier. And so as part of their sort of coaching work that they do, they create these retreats all over the world. They go to Machu Picchu and Costa Rica and you know, Mexico, wherever. And they had one in Montana and they invited me to come along. I'm writing about it for Paleo Magazine. And actually I got to pick where I wanted to go and I chose Montana instead of Mm -hmm. a tropical place, which people might think is kind of crazy, but that's exotic to me. Like I grew up in Bermuda. My mother's from there. Like I know what a beautiful beach looks like and I love it, but I'm not a mountain person. Like I grew up on the East Coast of Canada. I'm always like within sort of touching distance of the ocean. And so I was like, all right, let's do something completely different. So Yeah, spent four days in Montana. It's basically the way they lay out their retreats. Everything's kind of organized for you. So they have catered paleo healthy meals for every meal. You don't have to think about it. They have plans and activities all day long that are usually outdoors and active. So we went horseback riding in the mountains and we went on an epic hike, which I'll get into in a bit. And we went whitewater rafting and we worked out outdoors and it was uh, it was just so amazing. And I got to meet people that maybe were people I wouldn't necessarily go on a vacation with, right? So one of the yeah. cool things that they do when they bring people together is a lot of these retreats or events are generally geared towards like a specific niche, right? Like you're looking at maybe older people who don't want a vacation or don't want to go on retreats by themselves, or you're looking at like young fire breathers who want to go do a crazy adventure together. But these guys kind of bring everybody together. So all ages, all backgrounds, all interests, all activity levels. And it was really interesting in that regard, because you talk to people that are coming from completely different walks of life from you and have completely different interests and abilities. Um, but everybody's there just to kind of learn and connect with each other and enjoy their time sure. and be present. And so- How many people were there, eh? I think it was about 25. Oh, and in a super small world, I think I texted you like in the middle of the night once about this, but I one of the people on the retreat was Dr. Amy Killen, whom you met in yeah. London yeah. and interviewed. And that podcast is going to come out soon. But it was so weird because it was literally like two days after the Health Optimization Summit. And I show up <laughs> at this totally. ranch in the middle of Montana and I'm like, oh, hey, I know you. I was just emailing you the other day. Anyway, it was such a weird small world. And we ended up hiking together because she and I and our partners were kind of the most, I guess, quote unquote, hardcore of the group. And so when we did this hike that day, which ended up being like 13 miles round trip or something, it was like a pretty decent little hike, like up to a glacier. And we spent like five hours kind of talking and hanging out. And I was asking her about her work and how the health optimization summit went and your chat and all kinds of stuff. And we really kind of connected. We're friends now. And I'm like texting her. And it's so cool. It was really, Very really cool. cool. So, yeah, I really enjoyed her. I, I told you, like, going into that podcast, yeah. I really didn't know what to expect because you know, her background is amazing, but I really had no idea what to expect. But uh, coming out, like, you know, the listeners haven't listened to it yet, but they will very soon. And 
it's awesome. Like she's such a bright lady mm-hmm. and it's such a sweet and caring heart. And that's why what we do for a living is so great because we get put into these situations. Sometimes we know the person and we already like excited to talk to them and respect them and are super pumped about it. And sometimes we're like, don't know what the hell we're getting into. And it ends right. up being amazing. And that's what this trip was for me. Like as a, an introvert, we've talked about this before. I don't tend to like sign up for experiences where I'm stuck with 25 strangers for four days straight. Like that's not <laughs> usually my idea of a good time. And there's challenges to that, but it was really rewarding. And I got to see some of the most beautiful places in the world. I couldn't believe it. This hike, like if anybody's been to um, Glacier National Park, if anybody has been there, like you get it. It looks like every single view looks like something out of a movie that can't possibly be real. It was just incredible. And the fresh air and we saw bears, they didn't eat us. We survived. Like it was just, it was, really? it was crazy. It was so-, so. Was this the type of thing where you had uh, like some really good takeaways from it or is it just experiential? Like, did you learn some stuff and, you know, things you're going to apply into your life? Or was just like, I just had a really great experience that kind of filled my cup. Yeah. I mean, I think it was both. I think it was definitely experiential. I think that the thing that surprised me is that I, it sounds so pessimistic, but it surprised me that I did take something from it because I kind of went in expecting like, look, I'm writing about this experience. I know it's going to be great. Maybe I'll observe some of the other people there having their experiences. You know what I mean? Like that's really the way I looked at it going in. And by the end of the three days, like we did sort of guided meditations and kind of group conversations every day to sort of check in and see like, how are you feeling? And what have you learned? And what did you get from today? And I really did get that sort of, it's important to put your phone down and to connect and to really listen to people that are in front of you and to be open to learning from people who are different from you and who you may not normally reach out to for guidance or information. And I really was able to just kind of let go and relax and be there with people in a way that I didn't expect to happen. So that is something that I took away from it. Like I kind of left a little bit more calm and relaxed and positive about life and interacting with people. And it's not something that I expected to get. So I think I got more out of it than I wanted to. I don't want to throw you under the bus about revealing your plant medicine. uh, Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Look, whatever. I'll talk about it. Okay. So plant medicine. We've talked about this before and how terrified I am of it and how much I hate it. Oh yeah. Now I'm remembering. I texted you. I was like, Hey Ben, did some plant medicine. TBD. <laughs> yeah. So the friend of mine, so the company, by the way, if anybody wants to check it out, there's no affiliation, nothing, but these guys are great. So go check them out. It's called be the wellness.com. Adam and Vanessa, they're great people. B E E the wellness. We'll put it in the show notes. But anyway, these two are, like I said, they're sort of personal trainers and coaches, and they do a lot of retreats actually at Rhythmia in Costa Rica. So they're plant medicine based retreats. You might end up running into them because I know you're heading to Costa Rica at some point. And yeah, and they've done pretty much everybody at this retreat of all ages, whatever, all backgrounds. They'd all had some kind of plant medicine experience. A lot of them have done ayahuasca. So of course, I was asking every single one of them, like, how terrifying is it? Like, how much did you barf? Like, would you do it again? Because these are the hard hitting journalistic questions that I ask people. Anyway, I'm still not into the ayahuasca part, but my friend Vanessa, she does, is it Reiki healing? Reiki? Yeah. Yeah. So And that's really just, I feel like, kind of energy work, and it's a lot to do with like mindfulness and connection and meditation and being in your body and all of these things. And I'm open to that because I don't know enough about it to not be open to it, and I like to have new experiences. So she's like, all right, let's do this. Let's sit outside in this beautiful place, and we'll do some like energy work and some Reiki, and if you really want to bump it up a little bit, we'll add a little bit of plant medicine to it. And I immediately was like, like I just kind of tensed up, and I'm like, oh, no, don't make me do anything like painful or gross. And so she mentioned this, I guess, ceremony that uses a product called Hoppe. Have you heard of this? I haven't. Okay. So I guess essentially, and people who are listening who maybe know more about this than I do can feel free to kind of leave us some comments and stuff because I'm just speaking from my own experience. But it's obviously a much sort of lower dose, lower sort of barrier to entry than ayahuasca because it's a much kind of shorter, quicker thing and it's not as intense. And they often use it apparently in these sort of multi-day plant medicine experiences to kind of like warm you up to ayahuasca and the main event and things like that. But it's essentially powder tobacco is what I understand it. But the way, yeah, the way you ingest it is part of the sort of ceremony and it shouldn't just be like me doing it to somebody else. I don't know what I'm talking about. It should be somebody who's sort of trained in this stuff. It's very, very finely ground tobacco and they sort of lightly blow it up your nose. 
So I've seen this happen before. And I was like, eh, I don't know if this like really looks like a good time to me. I don't know. But I was like, look. I would have passed on that. You see, I, I'm not afraid of ayahuasca, but somebody blowing something up my nose. I'm like, yeah, thanks. Appreciate right? it, but I'm going to pass Right? It. So, okay. But I was like, you know what? I trust my friend. I know her. And everyone talks about with plant medicine or any kind of sort of drug experience, it's about set and setting and feeling like you're comfortable and supported and feeling like there's people around who know what they're doing. Right? And I was like, I'm in a safe place. I trust you. I just was like, let's do this. Okay? I was a little bit scared, but I'm like, let's do this. So, she's doing this Reiki stuff and kind of I'm breathing deeply and I'm feeling calm and whatever. And the way it works kind of, again, just like lightly blows probably like, I don't know, like a quarter of a teaspoon, not even of this powder up each nostril. And you're supposed to essentially hold your breath. You're not supposed to snort it back into your throat. And I guess the chemicals and whatever is in tobacco, it's going to burn. It's going to kind of give you a little bit of a feeling of euphoria. When it happened, I, it doesn't really hurt. It just kind of feels like it's burning a little bit. Your eyes water a little bit. Your heart kind of starts pounding a little bit. And then after a few seconds of holding your your breath, you kind of breathe out through your mouth and you sort of breathe in and out calmly and slowly through your mouth and let the sort of feeling, whatever feelings are happening, kind of overtake you. So as this was happening, I was feeling the physical feelings of taking whatever this drug is. So I was having that sort of endorphin rush and my heart was kind of racing. And then after a while, I was sort of calming myself down and it felt nice. I didn't have any crazy awakenings or experiences that I would sort of be overly excited about, but it made me feel less afraid to try new things like this because it wasn't scary and it did kind of feel nice. I had that sort of very physiological response to what was happening, which was the surge of adrenaline and then sort of a dump that always feels kind of calming and cleansing afterwards, right? So all of this took place over about 20 minutes and I felt kind of nice and we were talking about it. And I was like, all right, that wasn't such a big deal. It wasn't really life altering either, but it's okay. It's fine. She's like, great, that's nice. And then later that evening, so that day I kind of just felt nice and normal and nothing really to report. And then that evening we were all kind of sitting around in our group guided meditation around this beautiful fireplace and the lights were turned down and Vanessa was walking us through this guided meditation and telling us to sort of think about maybe something that we were holding on to or something that we were stuck on and to sort of contemplate it and think about it and think about why you're stuck on it and kind of just really be introspective. And I, at this point, maybe you and I could talk about it offline, but online, I'm not really ready to talk about what that thing was that I was thinking about. Sure. But I will say yeah. that I connected with that meditation and that concept and that internal self-work that night more deeply than I probably ever have during a meditation session. So as much as I love to be a critic and to think like, yeah, like plant medicine works for you because you want it to work and because you guys are all just like hippies and weirdos, like there's something there because I did this little fun little hoppe thing earlier in the day, no big deal. I did this meditation later that night and I had a really incredible internal sort of experience that I did not expect at all. Sure. So the perspective might just be removing that conscious, you know, sympathetic drive that always overrides your, you know, your prefrontal cortex is just always on, right? You're always perceiving, you're always thinking rather than just like wiping that clear and allowing yourself to exist in the experience. You're very analytical. You're very conscious. You're very, you know, executive functioning or highly executive functioning. And being able to kind of wipe that clear is what meditation is, is, you know, you become the observer rather than to judge things you perceive. And that seems to be what it was, right? If that's my my perception. Yeah, I think so. And I think maybe it's just so much more mind-blowing to me maybe than other people who are more ready to accept this stuff. Like some people listening might be like, yeah, dude, like you had an experience. You let your guard <laughs> down finally, like get over it. It's not a big deal. Right. But for me- that's pretty much what's going on in my mind right yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But for me, I was like, what? Like this actually- does work and it works for me too. Like it was just pretty mind blowing. So anyway, all that to say, I still am not sure if I'm ready to upgrade to the old ayahuasca, but I... So here's the thing with ayahuasca, right? It's not a light switch. It's a dimmer switch, right? It's not like I'm either going to go and have this completely transformative experience and puke my face off or nothing. It's like I can go and stick my big toe in the water, right? And just get a, a light experience that lasts for 60 to 90 minutes and okay, like either I'm comfortable with that or I'm really not comfortable with that, right? right? 
that's maybe the way to perceive it is and not trying to push you toward anything, but it's like just acknowledging it doesn't have to be the punch in the face that some people say it is, right? You can be very aware of, okay, today I'm just going to do, you know, maybe a 10th or a quarter or a third or whatever. And like, let's see what that feels like. And maybe it's nothing and tomorrow. Let's do a little bit more. And then, so rather than just jumping into the deep end, you're going like big toe first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's why there's so much talk in the health world and the neuroscience world and all of these things about microdosing a lot of different things, right? Because it's an intelligent way to gather data rather than, as you said, sort of diving straight into the deep end. Right. Well, so just like you experienced with the Hoppe, that's what you can do with ayahuasca. It doesn't have to be like, I'm going to change my whole life in one minute, right? It's going to be like, okay, let's just experience this and let's see if it actually feels good to me. And let's see if I actually gain any wisdom from it. Let's see if I care to gain any wisdom from it. Some people are like, hey, man, I like my life and I don't want to change. And why would you judge somebody for that, right? So, yeah, I think just using it as a tool rather than as an escape, like many people do. It's like, yeah, I want to see what it's like to access this altered state of consciousness or maybe what it's like to not think like me for a day, right? Like you saw, yeah. like, I'm not going to think like Ashley's brain right now. I'm actually going to experience something in a different way. And that's what's cool about it. You know, I can only think like me, right? You can only think like you. But if you can you know, remove that ability to judge and be very conscious and very aware and very restricted and guarded in everything around you, let that down, maybe there's another side to the perspective. And that's what makes me so excited and curious about this stuff is like being able to view the world without uh, goggles on, you know, like removing your spectacles mm -hmm. or goggles, whatever. Anyways. Yeah. That sounds awesome. Actually. It's so true. I appreciate being able to have this conversation, actually, because I've been kind of talking about it with people, but being able to sort of get it out in this way is really helpful. Because again, it's not something I'd even talk about. Like if I have an interesting experience or if I kind of learn something about myself, even that part, I'm like, eh, I'll just keep that to myself. Like you're right. It's like I use my own brain. I think with my Ashley brain too much and having just short glimpses of the ability to take the goggles off and see it in a different way is incredibly valuable. So mm -hmm. anyway, we'll see what comes next. I think there's but also value in doing the punch in the face sometimes, right? I think there's value in going like, I'm just going to dive in and I have no idea what to expect and I'm really afraid of it, but I'm going to do it anyways. And, or, you know, just sticking your big toe in, you know, I think there's certainly value in both, but again, maybe not the topic for today, but we did do that awesome podcast with Dr. Alberto Velodo. I didn't mm -hmm. listen to that. He's awesome. I was so impressed with him, just his ability to kind of keep it all grounded. I don't know if you got a chance to listen to that one back, but you know, rather than going off into airy fairy shaman space, which we've obviously had before, or I've had conversations with people before, where it's just like, hey, everyone should do plant medicine, and I'm doing it every weekend, and when they go to the bar and stuff, and I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> hang on a second. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was just like, well, it doesn't need to be four ceremonies in seven days. It should be one if you're properly prepared for it. And, you know, if you're not properly prepared for it, don't do it. And he's like, I don't even advocate everybody doing it. I think it's very particular and you're going to get a very particular response. And you can even elicit these states on your own if you just learn to create the right environment in your mind and body. And I thought that was just so valuable, right? It was just providing so much amazing perspective rather than just being this dogmatic advocate for everybody should do these things. It's like, well, why? Like, you know, ask yourself why, make sure yeah. you have an intention, make sure you're coming from the right place. And I thought it was beautiful. Yeah, that was actually one of my favorite episodes that you've recorded since you switched from muscle expert to muscle intelligence for that exact reason, because you might have some preconceived notions about what's going to be uh, talked about when you sort of read his bio and then you listen to it and your mind is just blown because he really has managed to bring together sort of the less tangible, more, you know, ephemeral sort of side of mental health and life and all that stuff. And then this really scientific, science backed information, he manages to bring them together. Together. So yeah, that was a really good one. Yeah, he's great. And I hope to connect with him again soon. He actually mentioned where he is in Chile and he's actually going to be having a month long, I guess, retreat in June and you know, offered to have me there. And I was like, well, that sounds pretty awesome. So if that happens- Go there and do some hoppe. Hey man, whatever, whatever happens, right? <laughs> Okay, let's switch now to Iceland because I can't well, stand so, it. You have to tell me everything about Iceland. before Iceland, right? So I had a week in London and I want to talk about that because it was really amazing and all the podcasts will come out soon. So a very different space for me, right? Walking into the Health Optimization Summit. You know, it's not the bodybuilding world. It's very different. It's not Mr. Olympia anymore. It's at these very high level researchers and, and you know, kind of the world's cutting edge doctors and therapists you know, in the realm of health optimization. And then you've got me talking about something that's kind of atypical for me, right? Getting into the mindset stuff and how we use exercise to really change our brain. And I, I loved it. And I felt so honored and privileged to be there because the people I was speaking you know, on stage with were 
literally some of the smartest human beings on the planet. So that was amazing. I think the talk went well with great feedback. But I also got to connect with some really cool people for podcasts. So I got to spend a little bit of time with Dave Asprey, which is cool. We sat at the same table at the VIP dinner. I got to connect with Aubrey de Grey, who there's a great story there, which I'll tell you in a second. I got to connect with Dr. Amy Killen. I got to connect with Dr. Harry Adelson. Uh, just brilliant people. And I was just so blessed to have conversations. So the most maybe interesting one, not that the other ones were interesting, but Aubrey de Grey, for people who don't know who he is, godfather of longevity, right? He's the guy who is basically defining what longevity is and then curing it, solving it. And he says within 17 years on the podcast, within 17 years, longevity doesn't exist or, or the concept of longevity no longer exists. He solved it. And I was like, okay. And that's, he's like, that's a subjective timeline, but I think that's, will be very accurate. But here's the irony of it. He walks into my Airbnb. I go, Aubrey, very nice to meet you. I offer you a water. And he says, I don't drink this stuff. It just takes up space. I said, oh, okay, it's interesting. I go, well, what do you drink? He goes, well, in fact, I just came from the pub. It's a pub right next door. I go, oh, he's like, I just, you know, I had a beer. I was like, well, would you like to go down and, and have a beer? So I go, we go down to the pub and we recorded the podcast in a pub, drinking an India Pale Ale with Aubrey de Grey, who's, the irony of that is blows my mind. Amazing. Yeah, but it was a really good podcast and such a great guy. We, we held a great conversation for just under an hour while drinking beer in a pub. And I'll be transparent. I don't really drink beer, man. I haven't had beer, I don't know, 15 years, maybe, maybe longer, <laughs> you know, since my, my good old Western University days. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're Aubrey de Grey's going to have a beer, I'm like, yeah, man, let's do it. Great podcast. You know, just kind of decoding what longevity is. He seems to think all of these efforts to be healthy are relatively futile. He says the only thing you need to worry about is your body weight and not dying in the next 17 to 20 years. And you're good. It's like, oh, that's interesting. You know, I, 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 I that seems pretty simple. Did he expand on why he thinks water is a waste, but beer is not? I mean, I think a lot of people would agree with that. But <laughs> Well, Yes and no. I mean, he just said there's no real benefit to it. To drinking water? But, so it, <laughs> okay, I can't well, wait to listen to this one. There's also one other one of the smartest biochemists that I've ever spoken to in my life. Uh, Dr. Laszlo Boros was on the podcast and said that he strongly advises not drinking water. And there was one of the presenters at the Health Optimization Summit who was, again, one of the top biochemists in the whole world who said, don't drink water. And that's interesting, right? Because our paradigm is like vegetables, man. We grew up, mom said, eat your vegetables, Ashley, if you want to be healthy and strong. Mm -hmm. And now we're like, hey, Ash, don't eat your vegetables because they're actually destroying your gut and your brain and don't drink water because that's going to mess you up too. And we're like, what do I do? Maybe I should just be eating like whale blubber and uh, chewing on bones. I mean, I could get on board with that, but did any of these people though offer like reasons why they think water is not a good yes, idea anymore? So the two biochemists, not Aubrey de Grey. He didn't mention deuterium. Actually, he did mention deuterium, but it was something different. Are you familiar with deuterium, Ash? Yeah, I've heard okay. about this before. So, yeah. You know, giving you guys the 30 second synopsis. Uh, everyone knows H2O, water has two hydrogen molecules. Deuterium, in fact, is what's called a high molecular weight hydrogen. So each of those hydrogen molecules has an extra hydrogen. So you're actually getting like twice as much hydrogen. So the hydrogen, because it's only one molecule, it's now doubled in its weight. So this high weight molecular hydrogen is very prominent in our water. And I don't remember the percentage, but it's like, I want to say it's like 40 parts per million or something like that. And that's called heavy water. So this heavy isotope is, you know, deuterium exists in our water. And they've drawn a very, very strong correlation between the accumulation of deuterium in your body and disease and ultimately death. So I did a podcast on it with Laszlo Boros. So ultimately, their suggestion is if you deplete deuterium X number of times per year, say you do it for a few weeks at a time, one to three times a year, your likelihood of cancer, illness, and disease drops dramatically because what deuterium does, these heavy hydrogen isotopes get into your mitochondria and are killing mitochondria by the second. So the more water you drink, the more deuterium you're consuming, the more mitochondria you're killing, the less energy you're producing, the less oxygen you're consuming, the more likely you are to get cancer. And they're drawing a one-to-one -one correlation between the levels of deuterium in your body and your incidence of getting disease. So obviously my brain goes, well, what do I eat and drink then? And their only answer is ketogenic diet. And these guys are not advocates of ketogenic dieting. They're just like, hey, this is the only way. Like meat is the only thing and fat is the only thing that has low deuterium. They're like, don't eat vegetables, don't drink water, only eat meat. <laughs> so what about like other beverages? Because if he's drinking beer, like our other obviously water-based- Aubrey wasn't one of the guys that talked about deuterium. He just didn't care. He goes, alcohol is not going to kill you, man. He's like, obviously, if it's an excess, it's, it may be, but alcohol in itself is not going to kill you. But like I said, he wasn't talking about deuterium. 
you're going to be thirsty. What if you're like working out and going for a nice hike? Well, and So that's what they, well, so realize all that stuff is not indigenous to us, right? Like it's not ancestral for us to work out and go for a nice hike. It's just part of our life. So you drink enough water to get by and no more. And if you think about it, like when in the evolution of humanity, would we have had a liter of water with us while we're walking, right? Maybe we'd stop at a stream and fill up and have a little bit, but like you're not carrying five gallons or whatever that five liters around every day with you as a human being, you're drinking kind of as little as you need to get by and you're persisting. And man, who knows, right? Like, do we know if that's the best way to live? I don't know, but it's an interesting paradigm. That's for sure. Something to consider. Is there any kind of technology, because I feel like I've heard similar conversations about this before with deuterium water, but is there some technology to get rid of some of the like heavy water? Because then you could do that instead and just drink water like a normal person. Right. It's extremely expensive. <laughs> yeah. And it only exists in Hungary, Russia, and one of the Middle Eastern countries like Saudi. So if we, yeah, if we want to get imported, it, and it's like $18 a liter. So there's a website, which I'll remember and send to you to put in the show notes, that you can actually get it in North America. But he says right now, they can only produce enough for about 10,000 people at a time. So like there's not enough to supply the earth, but there's probably about 10,000 people in the whole world that know about this stuff. So I'm probably going to pick up like a month's supply sometime soon and give a little spin. And and so Dr. Lazo Boros, his business is the Center for Deuterium Depletion, actually offered us a discount when he was on the podcast. And you can buy the water. You can also buy the testing kit to see what your deuterium levels are like, which is very interesting. And I know we have like an affiliate code or something, but I don't know what it is. So if we could track that down, we can put that in the show notes as well if anyone wants to check that out. Uh, he's based out of Southern California and super interesting podcast. I mean, may not have been interesting to you know, the typical muscle-oriented population, but super interesting stuff. All right. Well, if this is just one of the topics that you covered in one of the podcasts that you did in London, and you've got what, like at least half a dozen podcasts that came out of that trip. So this is going to be yeah. epic as they, yeah. as they come out over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, really, really great. And then so summarizing the trip, went to Manchester, had a three-day camp in Manchester with, I think it ended up being about 30 people. Awesome. And really, really high level group and really got to connect because when I teach these courses, the level of the participant is very important because if someone's very low level and I'm speaking to them and they think I'm talking Chinese, then it really slows down the progress of the entire group. So it was really awesome to have these 30 people who just got it. So no matter what we said, Dr. Shallow and I were teaching, no matter what we said, they got it. So it allowed us to push you know, higher and further into the content. So by the end of the weekend, these guys are all like, oh my gosh, this is so paradigm shifting and life changing, which is you know, it's cliche, but that's kind of what we aspire to. So it was an awesome weekend. Um, we had a bunch of people apply to sign up for my mentorship, which I've talked about. So anyone knows, like, I'll talk to you guys about that as the podcast goes on. But that's mm -hmm. definitely happening. It's all moving ahead, just not yet. So I've had a bunch of people apply. I've sent messages back to them, letting them know that the scope of the mentorship is too large to just start right now. And it, there's going to be an application process because I've already had a lot of people that want to apply and I don't have space for that many. Like, I'll probably take about 30 people in total. And the content is absolutely epic. So it's not just going to be me. It's going to be this really interesting synergy of business and body and mind integrated into like how to become the ultimate coach and business owner over six months. So again, you guys will hear about that as we go. Very limited space. And my objective there is like, I want to create these, you know, whatever super coaches around the world or even muscle intelligence advocates, because we get so many people that come and say, Hey Ben, where do I learn your stuff short of coming to your camp? So it'd be great to have these people leaving with six months of you know wisdom for myself and the people who are the best in the world at what they do. So pumped about that. Awesome. So now Iceland. Now Iceland. Tell me everything. <laughs> well, I've well, been there and I know how crazy and like stunning and weird looking the place is. Like I think sheep's head? I went once, it was years ago, and I just basically stayed in Reykjavik. I didn't really But do... you didn't eat a sheep's head? Uh, did I eat a sheep's head? I didn't. The thing I mostly wanted to do that I didn't get to do, and I'm guessing you didn't, is their super, super gnarly delicacy, the fermented shark. Have you heard about this? Man, you know, I almost did, but the one night I was supposed to do it, I was so gassed. I was so tired. I was like, eh, I didn't do it. 
people, I had a bunch of that one's stuff, gotta right? be like the most intense. Like I remember watching like all the, like Anthony Bourdain and Andrew Zimmern shows, like these guys who literally go into like tribal places and eat like raw animal that was freshly killed. And both of them were like, this is by far the most vile, like they couldn't eat it. So that, of course I want to, I'm like so excited, but it sounds like literally one of the most difficult things to eat on the planet. When the Icelandic guys who brought me over were telling me about this and they were giggling while they were saying, <laughs> like, all right, this has got to be really bad. I wonder how so many of them eat it, though. Like, I know it's like a delicacy, but like, do you think like the average Icelandic person can eat that? Yeah. So they said during, there's one week of the year where everybody kind of gets together and celebrates their culture. And they said during that week, everyone seems to have it. And same with the sheep's head. And, and there's also the Black Death, the drink that's I don't know, some black type of alcohol that I was supposed to drink. But again, it was supposed to go with the shark, maybe to wash down the shark. But it's <laughs> this is why they're so time. strong and hardcore because they eat terrifying so much, things every day. Uh, so much more than that, right? Like fast food doesn't exist. What do these guys eat for their snack? They're eating like dried cod, right? The delicacy or the treat for the kids is dried cod. And it's just unbelievable, the culture over there. It's so preserved mm-hmm. and untouched. You know, McDonald's and Burger King and you know all these other like Dunkin' Donuts have tried to go there and they lasted less than 12 months and closed down just because these people just know how to eat. You know, mm-hmm. they're eating real food. I mean, they're eating yeah, – I've had some really interesting things. Like I said, the sheep's head, which is very interesting. Anyway, so – Thor. I got to meet Thor. I honestly didn't even know it was going to be there. I had no idea. I just kind of went to his gym to meet Stefan Solvi, who's his training partner and awesome guys, amazing guys. And, and just like these welcoming, you know, gentle giants who, you know, we end up having dinner and just chatting for hours over way too much meat. Um, <laughs> no such thing. Yeah. But he's, Thor is legitimately the biggest human being I've ever seen in my life. He's six foot nine, 440 pounds. He's 200 kilos. So he was a little lighter than that now. He said he was a little bit light for himself. And like, if you see the picture on Instagram, it looks like I'm Photoshopped how small I look compared yeah. to these people. And like <laughs> all of them. And for anyone that's met me in person, I'm a lot bigger than you think. Yeah. Like people think, oh yeah, I've been 60 pounds down from his peak. Yeah, but I'm still a large human. But these guys made me look like I was like downsized, like honey, I just drunk the kids kind of stuff. Yeah. You know? Uh, and it was, but it was amazing. And so Thor and I recorded a podcast also, so which was super fun. Talked a little bit about his training, about uh, how he kind of discovered Strongman after being a basketball player. So that'll be coming out really, really soon as well, if it hasn't already by the time we drop this. Yeah. Did you get to train with them, with Thor? I didn't train with Thor. Well, so actually, yes, I did. So I was training. I think I was doing legs and he was doing chest. So I ended up helping him with some stuff and like he had some shoulder things. We were messing with some of his execution stuff and improving his shoulder stability. So I didn't train with him, but I helped him a little bit and yelled some profanities while he, we got a couple of sets for his YouTube channel. Amazing. Yeah, but I trained with Stefan Solvi, which is great. And another guy, uh, Christian, which is his training partner. And I mean, strong guys, fun it was great. Really great. Oh, actually, not sure. I did train with her. We did a hypertrophy leg session. It was very short, right before the podcast. Mm. So I did. I forgot about that. I guess that's not something I should gloss over. No. So to kind of reflect a question back to you that you asked me earlier, what was something that you got from your visit to Iceland? Maybe something that you learned or took away from either working out with these people, eating with these people, just kind of experiencing the culture. Like you mentioned, obviously, that they know how to eat. They obviously respect their culture and are deeply kind of connected to it. But is there anything else that you kind of took back from that trip? Actually, I think the reason you and I get along so well is because we both have this innate desire to kind of return to our ancestral roots, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't want to eat at McDonald's. You know, I want to make food that comes from the earth. I want to eat food that was maybe alive recently. I want to kind of just do things that are ideal for my system. And that's what they get there, right? Is they, They're so not Americanized, right? And that's not a shot against anybody, but the American system is very materialistic. It's very driven by accumulation of things. It's also very dominant, right? Which is what makes it so impressive when a country can be like, no, like you're American, we're Icelandic, and we're going to be who we are. Yeah. And the fact that they preserve that is amazing. Uh, You know, and they had such amazing success in athletics. And if you look at, well, okay, why? I mean, these people have massive craniums, right? They're feeding their kids so much fish oil. They're getting so much fish. Their heads are just, it's crazy to me. (laughs) the expression of how these guys eat and then talking to children there. I mean, the level of intellect of the children to me is is amazing. And, you know, the level of development and their ability to be athletic and move. And it's just, man, I think it just gives you an indication of kind of the steady decline of the human species over the last, you know, say hundred years, as far as our thriving as, as a species, right? Are we improving in medical and technological areas? Yes. But you know, if we don't get back to this ancestral way of living, I think 
the epigenetic influences cross generational will absolutely be expressing in you know subsequent generations right the idea that you know you're not what you eat you are what your mother ate and what her mother ate mm-hmm. and and that stuff is massive and if we keep letting it go on we're going to have some really interesting mutations at the genetic level that uh, ultimately you know either it's going to be positive because we're going to have to adapt to all this crap or we're, we're going to have a lot of people not able to survive speaking of our sort of mutual interest in ancestral health and things like that i have to just say that as this q and a that we're doing together it's continuing to kind of grow and people are seeing it and responding positively to it i'm getting a lot of messages and feedback which i really appreciate from people who are saying they really enjoy these q and a's and they are really learning a lot and they like the format and all of these things and they're also asking me a lot of questions and then me questions to ask you. So my inbox, my DMs are getting extremely lively these days, but thank you for that. But I have to say a couple of funny things that are coming through is I remember one of the first Q&As that you and I did together in Toronto, you were making fun of me for drinking like a sparkling water that was like flavored and you were like, this is garbage. And you made fun of me and it was really funny. And I posted a picture the other day of this other sparkling water because you know what? Sue me, okay? Water's going to kill me someday, but I like flavored sparkling water. Anyway, I posted about it in my stories and I got like more than a few responses that were like, oh, Ben's not going to like that. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm like, damn it. Now I've got like narcs in my DMs that are going to like tell on me for drinking water out of a plastic bottle. Anyway, we're not perfect, right? People telling me in my DMs about what you're eating and like, hey man, like... (laughs) Tighten this girl up with the nutrition. I mean, uh, I think I'm doing all right, but I mean, listen, we all have our flaws. Some of us just have to drink sparkling water every once in a while, you know. There's bigger problems, but anyway, I thought that was funny. But we have to wrap up pretty soon. But I did want to. We can't really finish this off without mentioning the show sponsor today, which is fantastic because you've just been talking about meat and eating too much meat in Iceland, and we've been doing a lot of stuff with our partner Butcher Box, who is sending us all kinds of great stuff, and you've got like some recipes that you're going to be sending out in your email like to our subscribers about a recipe that you use some butcher box products and they've just been like treating us really well i think people have been responding well i know we're getting like a bunch of signups and people who have been posting that they took advantage of the discount and they're enjoying it so i just wanted to make sure that we shouted out butcher box at this episode because they're doing great things for us it's really great quality and the convenience factor is massive for me, right? I mean, we're all busy and it's, you know, having to go to the store and actually find a great source of, you know, whether it be beef or chicken or fish is not always easy. And to get that at a discount, I mean, Butcher Box is just making it easy for us, which, yeah. you know, I'm so grateful for. And they just provide a good service. You know, they're, they're providing something that's simple and very uh, helpful to at all levels. So, you know, the more we advocate meat, the more we just continue to help push ButcherBox because like I said, they're supporting the podcast, they're supporting our listeners and uh, we want to support them. So head over to ButcherBox.com and what's our code with them, Ash? It's MI40. You get 20 bucks off and you get some free, two pounds actually, of free beef in your order. So it's pretty smart. Yeah. It's really good. So one thing I noticed about the butcher box beef, like I'll often make the ground meat and I'll just grind it up in a pan and make it. And actually the color of the fat that comes out of it is really interesting. So it's almost like a green. I really like looking at that and acknowledging that, hey, there's probably some level of observation of, hey, this thing used to eat grass. So the fat coming out is a little more green. Sometimes you see it and it's like this clear, kind of barely yellow, it just looks like not very healthy fat. You can smell it and you can taste it and the richness is awesome and it always smells so good it tastes so fresh and it's awesome and i've really enjoyed their salmon as well you know they have some wild caught salmon that i've definitely been enjoying you know, as often as i can actually after spending time in iceland i think i'm going to massively increase my salmon consumption because over there i was eating a ton of salmon because it's obviously amazing and growing up i didn't eat a lot of fish so you know it kind of took a, acquiring a taste for it but I was eating cod every day and salmon every day and even some salmon roe I had uh, mm. pretty consistently. I actually brought some back from Iceland because it was so good. I stopped at the shop and brought some back, some lava salt and some Icelandic salmon roe, which was amazing. And then I'm going to be adding into a meal at least two or three times a day. Seems to be working out for them. And you mentioned they, I saw in your stories, the amazing airport food that the Iceland airport has. So good. Yeah, they don't have any fast food. So I was like, what am I going to eat? And I'm like, I walk into the shop and I was like, are you kidding me? Like I took salmon, I took lamb uh, sausages, I took dried lamb because I never had it before. Took the salmon roe, 
and I was like, gosh, like how good is this? Why doesn't every port, every airport have this? You know, I'm just going to spend more time in Iceland, I think. And I got to go to the Blue Lagoon, which most people have heard of, which is an absolutely phenomenal hot spring that exists there. And I just, everyone should take a trip to Iceland and maybe I'll plan another camp there in the future and we can make it a destination. They want me to do that is do like a seven day retreat there. So you get to eat all the amazing food, experience Thor's gym, get some workouts in. So maybe Thor and I'll partner on that in the future. Amazing. I'm coming with and we're eating fermented shark next time. Well, I think we'll just spend a, a couple of days traveling. So my thought was, man, if I just arrived here a day early and planned to go fishing and you have your food for the week and you're, you've caught it, I think, gosh, this would be amazing. So it's all there and you've um, glaciers that you can go snowmobiling on and you know, it's just awesome. And I'm super excited to go back. All right. I see you glossed right over the fermented shark, but we'll just end it there and await. We'll definitely do that. I'll send you a video video of me eating the eyeball from the sheep's head, which I'm not going to post on social media because people get angry with me for, you know, it it looks like a sheep head on your plate. Oh, I think you definitely should. I will post my picture of eating the (laughs) eyeball that I ate a couple weeks ago because that is hashtag normal. Let's normalize that. It's food. Yeah. And so I have a great, but just under 60 second video of me eating the eyeball that Please if we have any requests it. for it, I'll, I'll post it. Okay. That's definitely <laughs> happening. And also maybe some pictures from the Blue Lagoon. If you've maybe did any like pose downs in the lagoon, that'd be great too. Sounds good. We'll do. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.